Um, most Americans who follow Homeland Security and counterterrorism issues know that uh, one of the responses to 9-11, of course, was the reorganization of much of the government that resulted in the creation of a new Department of Homeland Security. And we'll be talking to Secretary Napolitano and Secretary Chertoff about that at the close of the forum in great detail. Um, most Americans do not realize that another consequence of 9-11 was the reorganization of the intelligence community as well and the creation of a number of new intelligence organizations, including a new Uber organization, the Directorate of National Intelligence. To talk about how the intelligence community has changed for the better uh, and perhaps for the worse, for them to say, uh, we have two storied intelligence professionals, both of whom I know very well, and it's a, my great pleasure and honor to have them with us. The first is John McLaughlin, who no less an authority on the intelligence community and counterterrorism than John Brennan, said the other day, maybe a number of others of you were in Washington for the rollout of President Obama's counterterrorism strategy, and uh, that rollout took place at uh, Johns Hopkins University at SICE, where John McLaughlin is now a distinguished professor, and in uh, responding to uh, John's introduction of him, John Brennan said that John McLaughlin is the smartest man in the intelligence community and also the nicest. And I think all of us who know John would agree with both those characterizations. John was the longtime deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency, including in the key years right after 9-11 during uh, George Tenet's tenure as CIA director and DCI. And uh, after uh, Director Tenet's resignation, uh, John was the acting director of the Central Intelligence Agency for a time. And joining John on the panel today is a legendary figure in the Central Intelligence Agency and the larger intelligence community, Charlie Allen, who over the course of his 40-year career in the intelligence community has held, uh, held virtually every position of consequence within the CIA other than director of Central Intelligence. Uh, and Charlie was among the undersecretaries of the intelligence unit in the Department of Homeland Security, information analysis. Um, but I think it's fair to say that he took that unit to a higher level than anyone has done so in increasing the influence of the Department of Homeland Security in the intelligence community, and his successor is now building on his success in that regard. To moderate uh, this session, we have Mike Isakoff. Mike Isakoff, we all know, is a legendary reporter uh, in Washington, who's noted for his doggedness and his Catholic small c, uh, his knowledge of a wide range of issues. But when I think of intelligence issues in particular, I think of Mike Isikoff. And so that's why I selected Mike to moderate today's session. So with that, Mike Isikoff and this terrific panel. Well, um, thank you, Clark. And it's an honor to be back here, and especially on a panel with um, two, of, uh, two legendary figures in the intelligence community. But I want to start out um, uh, right off the news. Uh, less than a week ago, we had uh, the worst, most deadly terrorist attack uh, in Europe since the Madrid train bombings. And it had absolutely nothing to do with Al Qaeda or Islamic militants. Um, after that attack, um, I uh, interviewed uh, a former Homeland Security intelligence analyst, uh, uh, Daryl Johnson, who said this ought to be a wake-up call to US policymakers uh, that we need to refocus our attention from the uh, uh, focus on Islamic extremism to other forms of terrorism, potential forms of terrorism, uh, including uh, right-wing extremism. Um, Charlie Allen, you were the head of uh, uh, Homeland Security Intelligence. Uh, what's your take on that? My take on that is, is that the intelligence community, and especially the FBI, has been looking at the right-wing of right-wing extremists in our country for decades. Uh, the Timothy McVeigh event back in the early 1990s certainly awakened us to the fact that there we could have an extremist that could create great damage as what we saw in Norway with the central district blown up at the prime minister's office, which I've been in, blown up, and the terrible killing of the young people on the island outside. Uh, Timothy McVeigh uh, was not expected, he f was not known to be ready to do this. but. When I was at Homeland Security under Secretary Chertoff, 
we looked at right-wing uh, elements. We had a uh, healthy view that it could grow, uh, particularly as we saw that the Islamic extremism here could trigger uh, real prejudice, real bigotry on the extreme right wing. And we have seen some instances of that. Uh, the FBI has historically looked at right wing groups in this country uh, within the bounds of their legal authorities and uh, the view of what is an intelligence predicate in order to establish a case. Uh, I think today we are, we're doing a reasonably good job on this. Uh, I know the analyst in question, and I know his, he, when I was there, he pushed us to look at the right wing. Uh, there was a paper published after I left and before the current undersecretary arrived, which was not well written and was, did not have the depth and breadth of substance that uh, it should have, because it was published and I, I have read it. Uh, at the same time, I think we have to be aware of this, and I have to think that uh, at the state and local levels, and from the bottoms up, not all the information is going to be top down from the federal government, is that uh, the information sharing uh, has flowed, I think, down to the state and local much better. Under Secretary Chertoff, he gave me a lot of authority to do this. Bottoms up, I think we have to look harder at the, at the local levels and the local police departments. Homeland Security advisors, but I'm I'm not uh, I'm not convinced. But what we are doing a good job. Uh, could we do a better job? I think probably. But John, but, I mean, but at this stage, I, I'm uh, I believe we're giving it a lot of attention. So, but the specific point being made by Mr. Johnson and others is that we need to refocus attention, m more attention on this threat and perhaps less on the Islamic extremism threat. Well, yes or no? Uh, well, you can't answer it yes or no. I, I agree with what Mike said this morning. Mike Leiter is that there's this global uh, metastasized movement of, of violent Islamic ideological extremism, and we have an inbound threat. We have, and we can talk at great length about that, including affiliated networks, and we have a growing problem here of extremists. Uh, Inspired, uh, sixth edition of Inspired magazine has now come out, inspired by the ideology that Al-Qaeda represents. So from an overall resource point of view, I had more resources on the, on the Al-Qaeda affiliated networks and individuals but I had analysts that looked at, at the, at the right-wing militants. Uh, we worked very collaboratively with the Bureau, with Art Cummings, National Security uh, Branch, and we had a good relationship. John? Uh, I think uh, answering the question you just posed about whether we need to focus more on this, one way to think about it might be that we need to focus more on the interplay between the threat that homegrown terrorists represent in, a grow, in growing numbers, in fact, you just look at the data over the last uh, five or six years, the interplay between that and the potential reaction to it. I think that's the way I would say it. We just need to be aware of that. And take Europe, for example. If we accept as genuine the idea that these, uh, this Norwegian uh, guy was stimulated by uh, the influx of uh, Muslim immigrants, that's only going to increase. Muslims currently comprise about 5% of the European population, and the projection is with Muslim birth rates and with the pressures coming from population increase in the Middle East and lack of employment opportunities, that that figure in Europe will double. They will go in probably into areas that are, compared to the way people are assimilated in our country, into areas that are almost ghettoized. And so the potential for stimulating more of that in Europe is great. In our own country, if you look back over the last decade or so, since 9-11, there have been about 50 cases um, of radicalization involving Americans. Uh, about half of those cases were single individuals. The other half were small conspiracies. About a third of them were tied to groups overseas. And the rest were essentially motivated by whatever was uh, driving them here, self-motivated, uh, self if you will. If, and that's increasing. So there's about six per year for many years. 
And in the last couple of years, that's doubled. So if that's a trend in our country, what I would say is the potential for an interplay between a growing uh, case of radicalization here and a reaction to it by the right wing, I think that's what we ought to pay attention to. And there are, there are groups in our country, you know, who do this in addition to the government. There's the Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama, which uh, not well known to many people, but is a, a group that keeps very close um, attention on right-wing groups and on uh, extremists of all sorts. And I think probably Homeland Security was in touch with them at one we point, too. They're, they consult with the government. So that's uh, my take on it. Um, Secretary Panetta mm -hmm. recently said uh, and made some news saying we are within reach of strategically right. defeating yeah. Uh, yeah. Al Qaeda, um, which is quite a statement yeah. um, and um, has all sorts of implications. Uh, first of all, respectively, do you agree, John? Well, I, I, I'd, uh, you know, I, I know what Leon was saying. I know what he meant. Um, if I could kind of parse his words a little bit and then elaborate just slightly, I, I think what he was, what he meant, and I, I believe this much but I'm going to put some big caveats on what I say, which uh, in, in his soundbite he was not able to do. Uh, I think it is now possible for the first time since I've worked on Al-Qaeda to actually visualize, to imagine its collapse. Okay, you couldn't do that in 2005 for a whole range of reasons beyond just the fact that we hadn't found bin Laden at that point. The movement was still pretty strong. But when you consider you know, by 2005, we had destroyed the 9-11 era leadership of Al-Qaeda. In the intervening years, the drone strikes have really thinned out their bench. It's not a good career choice to be like the number three in Al-Qaeda these days. <laughs> and, and so it is a movement that has been seriously, seriously hurt. And, and so now you can imagine a future in which they are if not destroyed, they are, they are certainly much less relevant and less dangerous. Now, if you were to find and capture or kill Zawahiri and his deputy, um, this would take us far toward that goal. But all that said, here are the caveats. First, we shouldn't underestimate Zawahiri. I mean, to be sure, He's not as charismatic as bin Laden. Everyone's made that point. You're not going to find Zawahiri t-shirts, OK? But he may be more disciplined. He may be tougher. He's got street creds, prison creds. He's got Afghan war creds. Uh, he's the surviving member of the Egyptian mafia, if you will, that once was very predominant in al-Qaeda. Uh, most people don't remember that he's a physician who showed great interest in WMD development within Al-Qaeda. This is a guy who was introduced to and worked with a fellow named Yasid Sufat, whom Charlie will remember very well, who was at one point sort of the leading WMD guy in, in Al-Qaeda. Where now, is he today, by the way? As last time I Malaysia. knew, he was in prison in Malaysia. I think he got released a few uh, years I ago. I think he's out of, out of okay. I think he's free. Yes. So he's back on the street, he's somewhere. But uh, my point here is that we shouldn't underestimate Zawahiri. We shouldn't write him off too quickly. Second thing is, you know, I look at my press clips in the last couple of days, and some of them say Al Qaeda is about to collapse, and others say the State Department is warning the United States citizens to be careful traveling because Al Qaeda may be carrying out attacks. So we always have to remember there's a lot we don't know here. As much, we, know a, we, we know a huge amount about Al-Qaeda today. But for example, I, I suppose the prevailing theory is that they're not about to hatch another spectacular plot. But I don't think we know that with confidence, just because we haven't found evidence of it. They tried to do a 9-11 a number of times again. But uh, I'm thinking primarily in 2006 of the airline plot they were hatching over to bring down 10 airlines over the Atlantic. Had they done that, that would have been the equivalent of a 9-11 in terms of spectacular impact. They didn't do it. Well, it's five years later. So in the back of my mind, I'm saying that's the five-year attack cycle. Might they have something else on the shelf? 
Um, so I, that's, that's how I would characterize it, that you can visualize it, but we're not there yet. Charlie, I'd like to answer, but I, the, the question that comes to my mind when we hear talk like, uh, like this is, how will we know if we have defeated mm. al-Qaeda? Um, what metrics would we use for making that judgment? Well, the, I think that's a good question. I agree with what John has said. Al-Qaeda core is hollowed out, but still potentially dangerous. A lot of dangerous affiliates that have grown and they're resurgent. And they're still within Pakistan. We have the Tariqi Taliban that Mike Leiter spoke about. We have the Harkani, Harkani network. What we will know is, of course, there's been no successful attack inbound in the United States since September the 11th, no, no attack that we can attribute directly to Al Qaeda and its uh, central planning. But elsewhere, what we have seen is this metastasized network in, uh, that has, through the internet, has become very self-sustaining and we find people across the world becoming uh, engaged and believing in an extremist message. Uh, here, as far as metrics is, is concerned, we see a, the growth. Those are statistics that John just pointed out. Grew, grew from an average of four or six a year to something like 13 to 20 a year, of, where people have been, charges have been brought here against people planning. Most of the efforts were amateurish and were disrupted before they got very far. But from my perspective, when, when those statistics start changing and we have some comfort uh, in that we are, have a counter-radicalization strategy, and it's my understanding that the Obama administration will release a new counter-radicalization strategy, and then over time the statistics, uh, statistics change. And we don't have these events. We don't, are not bringing as many people uh, on charges. But the Bureau is doing this. It's grown up. It's grown quite sharply in the last three years. So we're, we're I think, a good long way from Al-Qaeda's finished, Al-Qaeda, you know, is decidedly on the verge of collapse. It is heavily damaged. It's hardly cohesive. You can't replace these uh, leaders. As Atiyah Abdel Rahman, who is essentially now the number two, was trying to tell bin Laden and Abbottabad in his little uh, hermit-like existence, we can't replace the leaders. But I think over time we can build those metrics, and we should. Um, you know, yeah, just, it, let's just add sure. something there. It, there's a lot of other caveats you have to put on on any estimates of its potential demise, including the ones Charlie just mentioned. You may want to talk a little more about the affiliates as we go along, yeah. because, you know, as Mike Leiter has often said, you you kind of look at Al Qaeda in in three levels: the core, the affiliates, and what Mark Sageman once called the leader, leaderless jihad. The, kind of singletons who pop up. In those latter two categories, um, while they may not be car card-carrying Al-Qaeda members, there's still a huge amount of danger, which others have talked about, right? on how we know it's over, how do we know we've won. This is a very difficult question. Uh, it's now a cliche to say there won't be a signing ceremony on a battleship, all right? The, the way I tend to think about it is kind of like communism. There are still some communists in the world, okay? But no one believes anymore. That's when we get to that point, then it's over. When they are a nuisance and not a deadly threat, then it's over. What does a nuisance mean? There's been terrorism in the world throughout history from biblical times, for heaven's sakes. There always will be. Um, but at some point, it will reach a level that will feel always horrendous, but will feel almost tolerable to the world at large. But we, we, we can also imagine a situation where we never quite get to that point, because yeah. you can always point to something that's out there. I was struck by Mike Leiter when he said this morning, pointing out that some of the more recent uh, attempted attacks in the United States, such as the Times Square bombing, yeah, was linked to the uh, 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 TTP in right, Pakistan, right. Pakistan, an organization that didn't even exist until a few years ago. Now, I know both of you guys are not lawyers, but the legal predicate for almost everything we do overseas 
uh, under the law of war is the authorization to use uh, force after the 9-11 attacks, which specifically spoke to um, uh, uh, retaliating against the people who attacked us on 9-11. Mm -hmm. When we were going after groups and people who were not even, the groups that didn't even exist at the time of the 9-11, do we need another way to, th to think about what is our basis for carrying out continued operations of this kind? Well, I don't know what, I wouldn't know how to parse the legalities of it, except that uh, and we have some lawyers in the audience, I know, but uh, when it comes to something like Tariki Taliban, I mean, you're absolutely right. Th this is a group that didn't exist for, for a long time. We didn't know a lot about it. And uh, it's important to remember, and this is strengthening Mike's point earlier today, that sooner or later someone's going to get through. You know, in the case of Abdul Muttalib, the underwear bomber, or the case of, Tariq, of uh, Faisal Shahzad, uh, the Times Square attempted bomber, I mean, nothing the U.S. government did prevented those two attacks from happening. Uh, that's kind of a startling idea when someone mentioned it to me. The, the, the detonators didn't work. That's correct. That's why they didn't happen. And they go to school on that, and sooner or later the detonator's going to work. And w w what the Faisal Shahzad episode with Tariqi Taliban illustrates is, and we have no warning of that, uh, that I'm aware of, maybe Maybe there's something that someone is aware of I'm, I haven't heard of, but um, this shows the incredibly labor-intensive nature of counterterrorism work. That means that in order to prevent that sort of thing from happening again, our intelligence officers have to do what we would call order of battle on an enormous number of small and seemingly insignificant groups um, who might be able to channel someone here or use an American citizen. That's, that's where the law does come into this. Faisal Shahzad was an American citizen. He got his citizenship, Times Square bomber, about a year before he attempted that bombing. Once you're an American citizen, you are in a zone where it becomes harder, understandably and for good reason, uh, for intelligence to get to you because of concerns about privacy, and the tension between privacy and security, and so forth. Um, it made me think that perhaps they've begun to think that even something like American citizenship can be a tactical weapon for them. Uh, in the sense, if you acquire that, then you can move about freely, you're under less suspicion, you've got a passport, and so forth. Uh, so. I yeah, think I that's, that's, that's where I have to yeah, say about that. I say on Umar Farouk Abdel Motalib, at least he was known to hold extremist views. He had a circle of friends in London that was not unknown that he held this. His father, of course, uh, Buja, uh, came and told the embassy, I believe, more than once about his worry over his son. On Faisal Shahzad, here's a guy who had a master's degree in business administration. His personal life had gone awry. He became more pious, but he was totally, as John pointed out, totally beneath anyone's attention. And uh, when it occurred uh, that his he didn't quite get his bomb right on Times Square, it was it, it, we, it was startled. There was no real record that would have immediately connected this individual to. And a lot of people travel overseas, travel back to Pakistan, and we don't know exactly where they all go. Yeah, he went up. And, and trained for six weeks with Tariqi Taliban. But we had no idea that he really was intent on, on committing uh, this kind of senseless violence. And uh, Times Square, even though it would not have been a 9-11, there would have been extraordinary reaction here and globally to that if were he if successful. That and we cannot, we, yeah, we cannot rule that this, this is going to happen. What Mike Leiter said today, we will not stop all. Um, and he pointed out resiliency as being crucial to this country. If uh, um, I want to move on a little bit after to, to another topic that's um, uh, got quite a bit of attention a couple of months ago after the uh, successful operation uh, against bin Laden, there was a pretty spirited debate as to whether um, waterboarding and other enhanced interrogation techniques um, had played a role in helping us unravel the courier network 
that uh, ultimately allowed us to get bin Laden. Um, John, you were deputy director of the CIA at the time. Enhanced interrogation techniques were uh, adopted. Um, what say you? Well, it's a complicated question. Uh, I think the way I would, uh, it's complicated for many reasons because uh, it's still a very emotional debate. I don't, don't think we've had this debate in a sort of uh, serious manner in our country yet. But uh, I think what I would say is uh, I can't prove to you that the interrogation program the CIA had produced the crucial link uh, that led us to bin Laden. Uh, but what I would say is that the crucial link, uh, well, first off, crucial link al already exaggerates the problem, already misstates it. This was a 10-year search, uh, an accumulation of data, but um, the link that everyone talks about is the, uh, the uh, pseudonym of the courier who ultimately led us to bin Laden, al-Kuwaiti. Uh, this is a name we learned from people who had received <coughs> what was called enhanced interrogation. It was a name we heard from detainees who had not received it. Um, and so you cannot make an absolute one-to-one -one connection there. What I would say is, I think it highly unlikely that we would have been able to develop the intelligence that led us to bin Laden without the CIA detention program. Because over a long period of time, the, the data amassed from those individuals was, to me, almost equivalent to breaking the purple code of the Japanese in World War II or understanding ultra the uh, German military code in World War II. Isn't it true, though, that... Uh, let, let me just add one more point, because when, okay. I, when I say that, what we learned from them, and the, what was the capacity to go back to those detainees time and time again in the years preceding the bin Laden operation and say, how do you communicate? Where are your safe houses? Who is connected to whom? <coughs> this phone number, who, who's on the other end of that? Who do they connect to? Um, this courier, um, what's his network like? So it was the capacity to go back to them almost as consultants and fill in a blueprint, uh, a scaffolding, if you will, of this organization, which one had to understand in order to interpret all of the data that got us to this. Isn't it, isn't it, uh, uh, Charlie? Let me just quick, add to yeah. that because John has it absolutely right. It was, oh, it, it was the aggregate of data human source reporting, detainee reporting. KSM probably gave us 2,000 reports. I think I read all of them uh, over a series of years. Uh, and then the technical intelligence, uh, which we can't really talk about here, uh, the massive technical intelligence that aided in, and accelerated understanding of Al-Qaeda and its, uh, its activities, how, how they communicated, all of this in the aggregate was very vast. I don't think you can just separate the variables into what happened during interrogation and what happened when we finally got the key final missing link. I just think that's a very poor way to think about it. It was an enormous effort led by CIA but with NSA, NGA, and others helping enormously in this whole process. Isn't it true, though, uh, that after KSM was waterboarded 183 times. He actually provided false information about the courier. He didn't give up the name. He didn't, he played down his significance, suggested he was retired. Um, if that's the case, how can one draw a connection between intelligence gleaned from yeah. waterboarding yeah. Uh, and uh, successful uh, information about the courier that led to bin Laden? Well, it's very interesting. Um, if you know, this, now this is, there's so many misunderstandings about this program and, and how it worked and the way it worked and what was valuable in it. First off, KSM told us, I have to say this by, ver by background, he told us a lot of things that were absolutely true. Tremendous. Absolutely true. Without his information, we wouldn't have captured 
basically the, uh, the hit parade of bad guys we captured after 9-11. I could name them if you want. So we knew that this guy could tell the truth and would tell the truth, um, particularly when you presented him with knowledge that uh, you had of his operations that you had gleaned. So as you went along here, you learned more. As you got a detainee, you knew so much that you could then ask that person a question that showed the detainee. You, you understood this, and, and they just had to fill in one little blank for you. So if you know he tells you the truth, and you've established that empirically, and if you know from others that this particular courier exists and is important, okay, and you have confidence in that, you're taking that to the bank, and then he lies to you about that, that's a huge giveaway. That's, that's a giveaway that, okay, this guy is every bit as important as we've heard. See, that's, th this program didn't work as people imagine it working. This was as much a head game as anything else. Because the argument, of course, always is whether the same information could have been gotten through other means. But just to sort of sum up on this, um, uh, I take it because both of you were there and both of you were involved. Yes. Um, you both believe that waterboarding and other enhanced interrogation techniques produced valuable intelligence for the CIA, correct? Well, I believe the detention yeah. program and the interrogation process right. produced crucial information because one thing that was apparent on 9-11 is that CIA and others, we did not have a profound understanding of al-Qaeda and how it operated, all the key players, that, as John talked right. about, and we learned enormously. And by the way, only three people were waterboarded. We have this right. image across this country that there were dozens. It was three people. Uh, yeah. there's, a couple right. of, there's a couple of other context points that are essential yeah. here. One is a matter of scale. During the entire period that we still, I think, call the War on Terror, um, there were never at any one time more than 100 individuals in CIA in t in detention, including right. long after Charlie and I were there. Only uh, roughly a third of them received anything like what you've heard about as an enhanced interrogation. Only a tiny fraction of them received anything like the ones you've heard most about, waterboarding. And that ended in 2003. And these were not battlefield detainees. These were the Hitlers and Stalin of the movement. These were the really bad, tough guys. So that's a context piece that I think is essential to even right. talk about. And now, I just your, want now your question. That's correct. You said, you, you were asking, do we think this was valuable? Was I that think you've already answered the question. You've said yes. Well, you know, I think most people who were involved at all with the program would say that and would just understand so, it instinctively. So why'd you stop? You, see, you didn't waterboard anybody after 2003. If this was producing valuable intelligence, why did the CIA stop waterboarding? Um, we knew everything that we needed to know, for one thing. Well, you uh, had plenty of detainees you got after KSM, including some pretty serious players. Well, a couple of things involved here. Um, first, as this program went along, our knowledge base had increased to a point where not much of this was required. And second, uh, there was a point in time, I can't pinpoint it for you. Remember, we went back to the Justice Department at least four times in, with major requests for affirmation, reaffirmation and reaffirmation that uh, our program was on solid legal ground. And there was a point in time here, I can't pinpoint it for you, where the Justice Department uh, began to raise a question about that and therefore, our view was, okay, we don't do something if it's yeah. not clearly understood to be legal. Our, our, and John is right. Our understanding by 2003 was really vast because I remember distinctly on the, in late July 2006 being called by the head of operations of CTC to come out and, and look at some information. I already knew what he was pointing to, 
But to go out and to again read a number of KSM uh, interrogations, debriefings, he laid out what became the aviation plot in August 2006 because he described in detail, in infinite detail, what would be in the so-called Bajinka plot and how it applied today. So uh, I believe our interrogation program saved lives. It disrupted plots. It enabled us to go after the people that really counted in this extremist evil organization. And any time I lost my, uh, my will, I would read the bios of those killed on 9-11 that appeared in the New York Times, one of your sponsors here. And it renewed my energy to do more. So was President Obama wrong to ban these techniques entirely? We were not using, the, we were not using enhanced interrogation techniques by the time he took office. Yeah, but he's banned them and says, we will not use these anymore. I think we understand more. Uh, when, when I don't think you can begin the people here unless you were in, in the middle of this, and John was at the epicenter, and I was close to John, along with George Tenet. The pressures from the Congress, the pressures from the administration, and the pressures from the public, and the pressures internationally for us to be able to disrupt and thwart another attack on the United States or on our allies. So we worked at it very hard. And in and, and my view, John laid out the legal case. Uh, uh, we're, neither of us is lawyers, but we certainly listened to a lot of lawyers describe just what was, what was appropriate and how it would be appropriate. Yeah, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say the president was wrong. Uh, so we were right to do it then, but we're right to, not, to, to ban it now. What I would say is that the, uh, the CIA always, first, CIA works for the president. Second, the CIA will always want to be carrying out a policy that is on solid legal ground and that is an American policy. That's determined by a, a lot of different factors, including by elections and by which presumably capture the will of the people. And so when the president expresses a view, this is what I want the CIA to do, or not do, the CIA is going to salute and not do it or do it. And it, it pretty much comes down to that. Right. Um, you know, there are moral choices involved every day in the intelligence business, and they change over time. Uh, General Petraeus said something in his confirmation hearing that resonated with me. He said something to the effect that um, it's hard for any of us to imagine I'm not quoting him, I'm just trying to capture the thought that I think he expressed. It's hard for us to imagine now the tenor of those times and what it was like then. Um, again, I can't quote him exactly, but he said something to the effect that I can imagine circumstances in which the way we think about interrogation policy now could change depending on very, uh, you know, potentially disastrous circumstances. The statement to which Senator McCain, as I recall, agreed. Now, I may, I may not have this exactly right, but that's my recollection of the press I read. Um, One of my colleagues said to me, hey, you know what? That's exactly what was going on in 2001 and 2002. Um, I'd like to... And that's not going on anymore. You have one it's more a different point. time. No, I just agree. I just okay. agree with John. You just can't understand the, the pressures that we were under at the time, and, and we... You know, CIA does these things, but they do them thoroughly legal. George Tenet and, and John led the way. We, we worked and reworked the legal opinions, not only at the agency, but with the Justice Department, the White House, and it was briefed to the Congress. And uh, we did not mislead the Congress, as Leon Panetta says. We never do. When we go to Congress, we tell the truth. Um, the country's done a lot of, did a lot of things in response to uh, September 11th, and one of those was to completely revolutionize the intelligence community. And we've had a proliferation of intelligence agencies crop up since 9-11. We have the creation of the DNI. We have the creation of the Department of Homeland Security and the intelligence uh, uh, division that you headed. Um, we've had the FBI uh, turn more and more into an intelligence agency with its own uh, intelligence um, uh, uh, analytical division. Um, 
How many intelligence agencies does the country need? <laughs> I think that's a good question. I, I, and I believe that what Mike Leiter said, 10 years later as we are now in the second decade of the 21st century, it's probably time to, to make sure we have this right. I, I firmly believe that where we are with the uh, Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004 and the creation of the Director of National Intelligence, that that effort needs to work. And the community as a whole needs, with the Congress and the White House, needs to ensure that it does work and work more effectively uh, over time and that it, it, we are able to consolidate and make cost savings. As far as Homeland Security, there are, there are major responsibilities uh, for DHS intelligence. Uh, Clark Ken Irvin has written about it and has talked about the importance of that. Someone's bugging the room. Yes. And I, I, <laughs> Which intelligence agency uh, sent that one? I, they, I don't know. <laughs> and we, at one time, uh, we didn't have DEA as part of the U.S. intelligence community, or, and, and now it is. The Coast Guard is well embraced. Uh, it always did intelligence, whether it was in or outside the uh, intelligence domain. So from my perspective, uh, we're finding that balance. It's time for perhaps reviews. Uh, my view is DHS intelligence needs to continue to grow and strengthen, particularly to help on border security, to help the operating components of DHS, the headquarter elements. I supported the secretary and his headquarter elements and to do that more important work with state and local governments, and also to find a way to be more useful to the 18 private sectors. The French have, I think, uh, 13. The British have seven. We have 18. America always has more private sectors. So to help that, because I think we need to do a far better job of working with the private sector. So I, I do believe that it's time for some review and some reflection and, on this. And some cutbacks? Possibly. Certainly, uh, uh, exponentially, the budget of the intelligence community cannot continue to grow. I was, we used to, we had such a reduction in the 90s when we started getting the supplementals and the money. It was, I don't know how John felt, but it was hard for me to believe we had this money and could we actually have to spend be, it. We have to be real careful to avoid the classic Washington pendulum effect. That's right. In the 1990s, uh, you know, after the wall came down, the two words on everyone's lips were peace and dividend and uh, intelligence was reduced by about 23%, the military by some figure as well. Well, in the 90s, that's when we discover bin Laden. 1996, we form a unit to follow him. We have the Balkan Wars, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, the, the requirements on intelligence were growing, and we created, by cutting it back dramatically uh, because we thought the threat had gone, um, we created a terrible demographic problem, and we were so... You know, people. Re At one point, we were hiring just a handful of people every year. Uh, it's been said that uh, there was a moment in time when there were more FBI special agents in New York City than there were CIA case officers around the world. That's true. We really cut back. So after 9-11, everything was plussed up. One can argue that certainly the intelligence community, I would argue, it, it needs to be part of any sort of budget squeeze that we have to go through as a country. But as I was saying earlier, it's particularly until, until we reach that point when we think terrorism has hit that bottom, it's a very labor-intensive business, counterterrorism. And it's I just very like, labor-intensive. Excuse me. I'd just like to add what Mike Leiter said this morning is we have to look at these other big issues out there, proliferation, which is a, a, going to be a growing problem. We're all concerned over weapons of mass destruction. We have other... We have the hard states, Iran, North Korea. Uh, we have other issues of the larger states of Russia, China, to make sure that we have good intelligence collected and assessed on, on the rest of the world. And so it, it, and the military was cut 33% in personnel during the 90s. CIA was cut 24% in personnel and 20% in its budget. And we lost a, a wealth of well-trained officers who went out early, and uh, we certainly could use them in the field today. It's true that if you, if you came down from another planet and said someone told you to then organize an intelligence community, you might not do it this way. That's right. 
In other words, it's, it's a very complicated organization, well, well, but it works the, reasonably well. One of the things intelligence agencies and analysts do um, when they're created is write reports. And um, Homeland Security uh, Intelligence is known for writing reports to state and local officials. Uh, the utility of which has been called into question. Um, reports such as the one a few, uh, 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 a few weeks ago on July 4th, I have a report here, uh, DHS urges vigilance on July 4th, um, uh, Al-Qaeda might be contemplating large attacks on the homeland on symbolic dates such as U.S. Independence Day, but of course we currently have no specific credible information that any such plotting is taking place. I brought along one uh, I particularly enjoyed for the Super Bowl last year, uh, it's uh, unclassified, but for official use, uh, says the th same thing. Uh, 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 Al-Qaeda could make, uh, the Super Bowl's high profile could make it a desirable target for violent organizations or individuals, uh, but of course there are no credible terrorist threats to the Super Bowl. At a time of a scarce uh, resources at the federal level where people are looking to cut um, is it fair to say this could be um, one area where um, the government could cut back? Well, we can be selective in putting out alerts or advisories. Those are fairly routine. When we have a special security event, uh, we always do something to look at it, whether it's a, a Democratic National Committee meeting, or a, a conf convention, or the Republicans. Uh, or the these, Super Bowl, because so one of the things it does bring together is that it, it goes out to police departments, fusion centers, goes out to Homeland Security advisors, and they know that we are working on this at both federal, state, and local levels. Uh, I think we, we could be selective, probably more selective in this, but we also put out, DHS intelligence puts out things that are very vital, which are very timely, particularly if a crisis starts to develop, and something has occurred here or abroad, we immediately let everyone know at the state and local level, Homeland Security Advisors, and the private sector. After the aviation uh, plot in 2006, I found myself briefing uh, several hundred people from the private sector on the, the events that had just transpired and the fact that uh, liquid explosive was a new technique to be used. Uh, I think, uh, but we also put out very classified and sensitive reports through our, our Homeland Security Data Network. Mike Leiter over at uh, NCTC, we used our data networks to get out thousands of assessments at the classified level from NCTC, So we, uh, which go out to our state and local governments if they're certified to receive information at that level. So, uh, yeah, you can find things that, that are, are perhaps uh, on the periphery, but we do a lot of vital work as well. I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, before bin Laden and al-Qaeda, um, uh, the number one terrorist, um, international terrorist, um, during the Reagan era was Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, and he was uh, linked to the, um, uh, we, certainly, we had the Lockerbie bombing and in which a Libyan intelligence agent who just showed up uh, at a rally in Tripoli the other day uh, was convicted. Uh, and yet, uh, starting in 2002, um, the U.S. government began to make its peace with Gaddafi uh, and eventually lifted economic sanctions, uh, established relations. Secretary Rice went to visit him. President Obama shook his hand uh, at the G2 summit in Italy. And that began with the CIA's um, uh, uh, overtures to Gaddafi and the deal that you made, um, you at the CIA made in 2002, for him to give up his weapons of mass destruction in exchange for allowing him into the community of nations. Um, given where we are today, once again viewing Gaddafi as an enemy, um, did we go too far in making our peace with Muammar Gaddafi? I don't think so. Uh, going back again to those times, um, let me mention how that operation came about. Uh, you know, for months, uh, in 2003, 2004, in that time frame, uh, CIA officers with 
counterparts from Great Britain secretly went to Libya and having heard that Gaddafi was interested in exploring giving up his biological and nuclear programs, chemical programs, talked to him about it. Um, eventually he agreed to do it. And this was all sort of part of a larger counterproliferation effort uh, in which the intelligence community, principally the CIA, took down the AQ Khan nuclear proliferation network, which was servicing Gaddafi. At one point, we were able to actually take his nuclear program manager's centrifuge parts that we had captured and intercepted and more or less hand them over and say, we know what you're doing. So under this kind of pressure, Gaddafi agreed to give up his weapons. And I had heard from a <coughs> counterpart in the Middle East as late as, well, as early as 1999, um, someone who knew him quite well said to me, he's tired of being a pariah. He wants to somehow get out of the box here a little bit. So with that as a background, this operation is carried out under which he agrees to surrender his weapons, and he does. And we can certify that. Now, I can't recall with detail, there's, there are people in the audience who will know this better than I, or will remember it more accurately than I do, but the government and the Bush administration developed essentially a matrix of things that he had to do in order to get a tidbit of concession. You do this, you'll get this. You do this, you'll get this. You do this, you'll get this. And, uh, and we sort of marched up that ladder, making him comply with very stringent requirements on things like weapons, terrorism, um, and so forth, hu human rights. And I frankly, I lose track of the story because I leave this process in the middle of the decade. But by doing so, but we gave him greater legitimacy. In return for True. his yeah. uh, concession of many, on many important issues. Um, and now we're involved in the In other words, in he, didn't get, he in didn't get a get out of jail free card. He got sure. a, a get out of jail if you pay this very big price in terms of your national policies. Now, do, do I think we should have a different policy today? No, we have the right policy today, although it's looking very hard to achieve a successful end result for a whole bunch of reasons we could talk about. But um, I guess yeah. my bottom line is no one was trying to be nice, nice with him. Yeah, they were trying to hold his feet to the fire. The fact he has created problems, I was heavily involved in the bombing of uh, Tripoli and Benghazi back on the 15th of April, I guess, 1986, after the bombing in Berlin. Uh, he obviously plotted to get some revenge on that issue. I think uh, uh, we worked very hard in the early part of uh, uh, the first part of this decade to find all his WMD efforts. He had them underway. Uh, the fact that we were able to conduct this operation uh, with uh, allies and others, but uh, and it was an intelligence-led activity. The fact that we stopped his WMD development and uh, we knew that he was working on H, he, he aimed to develop an HEU capability, highly enriched uranium capability. I think that was a, a great accomplishment. The fact he's a recidivist yeah, today I mean, is of no surprise to me. Yeah, history doesn't work, you know, the way you always want it to. What happened here is there's an uprising in Libya uh, which I don't think anyone anticipated. That's right. Where would we be today if he still had chemical weapons? Hmm? I think we're better off. Um, I interviewed Frank Anderson, who was uh, another legendary CIA yep. we all officer, know Frank. Uh, yep. He's who you man. both worked with um, earlier this year, and he told me there's no doubt that Gaddafi ordered the Lockerbie bombing that killed nearly 200 Americans. Um, if that's the case, and I'd like to ask if you both agree, um, why would we make peace? Why would we shake, why should the President of the United States shake hands with a terrorist with that much American blood on his hands? Well, you know, I could, I could dodge that by saying, uh, remember, intelligence officers don't make policy. 
Um, and and I, that would be a dodge. And that would be a dodge. Uh, but I think what I, the way I would answer that is, you know, in foreign policy and intelligence, um, let's say in foreign affairs generally, you make difficult choices. You, you, you weigh benefits against risks. And at some point here in our government, uh, people weighed the benefits of going down this road against the risks and concluded the benefits were slightly greater. These are never 70-30 decisions. They're almost always 55-45 decisions. And I think in this case, uh, a number of things were in play. Um, a lot of this occurred in the midst of a, a war against terror. There were groups in Libya that we wanted to take down. Okay. Uh, there were areas where I think, uh, without going into any classified information, we, we thought we could get information from Libya that would help us. You make these choices. You weigh risks against benefits. And, you know, at the end of the day, you have what you have. And, uh, and, Did, you, yeah. and you recalibrate. So There's here we are. We're, with, we're, we're looking at a Gaddafi that is, uh, we all want to get rid of him. And, you know, Libya is an artificial creation anyway. It's, 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 it's the inheritance of Italian colonialism. At the end of the day, I will not be surprised if we have two Libyas. Uh, I would guess that at the end of the day, I'm sort of with Secretary Gates on this, that at the end of the day, Gaddafi probably will be gone, um, and it'll probably be because someone in his entourage decides it's time for him to be gone. It's just too much. Yeah, there's no, no doubt that Libya did Pan Am 103. I think the agency and others working together, with the Bureau and others we put together is something that's very convincing. We uh, And the view is, of course, it was not just the bombers themselves, but it had some higher echelon uh, uh, approvals of this. But I do believe it, 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 at that stage we had to make a decision. We had sanctions rather than kinetic options. Again, we had one kinetic option against, against Gaddafi, which we directed our aim, as you recall, at his, at his headquarters in, in a major way. Uh, I think we have to make these hard decisions, and stopping the WMD and the proliferation was such an extremely high priority. I, you know, as an intelligence officer looking at through my prism, what happened on, I guess, 19 December uh, 2003 when Gaddafi uh, renounced uh, his weapons of mass destruction program and opened up a lot of information. And, and I was the assistant DC Africa Collection. We had worked so hard to find all those facilities, and we certainly did not know many of them. At once we saw what Gaddafi had, I think it was a serious, de a serious decision and probably a right decision. It stopped him at that stage. You know, thinking uh, about your question, though, it's interesting to me how intelligence does end up kind of at all these crucial junctures. <laughs> Frank Anderson's right. I mean, there's no question that Libya carried out the uh, Pan Am 103 bombing, and in all likelihood, I wouldn't challenge Frank's judgment that Gaddafi ordered it. Okay, who figured that out? That was the intelligence community, through very careful detective work involving, you know, finding the detonator. We had a guy who recognized the detonator. We had people who knew where the luggage had been, figured out where the luggage had been purchased. So, you you end up finding intelligence sort of at all these critical junctures, and uh, at those junctures, history swerves off in one direction or another, and intelligence shows up again at the next juncture. Well, I know that there are a lot of other questions that um, uh, members of our audience um, uh, are going to have, so I want to um, uh, throw it open now to anybody um, who wants to um, ask um, the um, woman back here with her first to raise her hand. Uh, Gail Harris with the Foreign Policy Association. I was wondering what you thought uh, the chances are that the terrorist group, either Al Qaeda or others, might resort to cyber attacks to make big impacts. You know, I've tried to convince people uh, to worry about that because if you think, about, but I, I can't say I've been very successful, and I'll tell you why. If you think about it, uh, ultimately they want to destroy our financial system. 
I mean, the latest issue of Inspire, I believe, has, this is the magazine that comes out of AQAP in Yemen, um, in that Alaki, Al Alaki notes that it cost them about $4,000 to do the package bomb operation, but that we will spend millions of dollars now, tens of millions of dollars, ensuring that we are inspecting packages and cargo. Now, that's their objective. So you can do a lot more damage with a keystroke than you can do with a bomb. The only thing I can think of, it's a bit like the question we all have regarding biological weapons, which is, why haven't they used them? Uh, why haven't they built them? Um, biologists tell me there's been such a revolution in biology in the last decade that, you know, what you used to get a PhD for do now technicians do. And, and the barriers to culture acquisition, weaponization, and delivery are all sort of gone. They haven't done that either. In, in the case of cyber, I just have to assume that they don't have the kind of skill that a state sponsor would have or the kind of skill that some of the world's great hackers have. Now, I'm not sure I believe that myself, I'm, but I'm sort of trying to reason through why haven't they done it. Um, so I'm not taking it off the table yet. Uh, I'm not taking it off the table because I think they're going to surprise us again. Uh, and they're focusing on our vulnerabilities. And that's certainly one of them. Anybody else? Yes, over here. Thank you. Charlie John, thanks for your service to the country. Uh, I'm Val Oxford with the Tory Group. I've spent the last 18 years in counterproliferation, counterterrorism. My dealings with the WMD Commission led me to recommend to them that they, they push hard to make sure those two communities did not bifurcate. I was heartened to hear Mike Leiter say they were working closer together than ever. Uh, the, the question I pose is there are those in the policy community starting to suggest it's inevitable that Iran will go nuclear. We will have to deal with a nuclear armed Iran as an international body both domestically, within treaty uh, norms, et cetera. What, what are your ideas on the implications of that, especially when we know there has been a nexus between Iran and terrorist groups? Well, in my thinking about it, there's, yes, they're, they're moving along that path. Uh, the last time I had saw what I thought was accurate press data on it. I think it, they were said to have had about 4,000 pounds or kilo, I forget the measure, about 4,000 pounds of uh, low enriched uranium, 20%. Mm -hmm. When you're at that level, it doesn't take long to get to 89, 90%. And um, that's probably enough for about two bombs. And um, They're not there yet because of problems they're having with their centrifuge um, systems. Um, it's hard to imagine that they can't get there. I think the prudent thing to assume is that left alone, they're going to get there. Or they're going to get to breakout stage. You know, just, then that's the real nightmare. They're, they're just two or three turns of the wheel away from having a nuclear weapon, and they stop there, and everyone can see that. So there's basically only three ways to deal with this. Um, sanctions, which uh, are apparently biting a little bit, but not so much, I don't think, from, from where I, what I can judge. Not, not enough to stop them. Military action, which I think would be disastrous on a whole range of levels. Here I am getting into policy. Uh, their systems are so buried, and we may not even know about all of them. A great intelligence success finding the one at Com some time ago, a couple of years ago. Um, so you'd need deep penetration weaponry, which I don't, just at most you'd delay it. And third, figure out how to live with it. Those are sort of your options. Well, how do you live with it? Well, that's an ugly option, but you can do a number of things. You can work with the uh, other countries in the region to very hard work with them to persuade them not to go down this path because you don't want a cascade of nuclear proliferation in that part of the world. And I'm talking here about you know Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and so forth. Um, 
Second, you can have a declaratory policy by which you tell the Iranians, don't do this because if you ever even have a, a, you know, a suggestion of using this, there will be consequences. That's always a tricky thing to do because then you have to actually have consequences. And, uh, and you can also think about another ugly thought, which would be some sort of a nuclear umbrella for the region. So there, I'm thinking out loud here, but those are some ways to think about it. And the, the chief danger, I think, would be that uh, you, you would really risk a nuclear cascade in that region. Now, we haven't talked about the Arab Spring. That affects counterterrorism. You know, when we talk about counterterrorism in the future, you've got to think about the Arab Spring and how that plays into it. And the conventional wisdom now, I'll come to Iran in a minute, and the conventional wisdom now is that, well, al-Qaeda is losing here because the Arabs changed their governments without violence, thus giving the lie to the al-Qaeda argument and so forth. Well, I think the Middle East, Egypt in particular, is about where France was in 1789. Now, there's <laughs> going to be a second revolution at some yeah. point. Look at the, I'm veering way off here, but I want to, <laughs> I'm coming back to Iran. Stay with me and, and hit the clock if we're over time. Who, who's the Robespierre? Uh, if only we knew, if only we knew. But my point here is that, if you look at the, look at the, uh, the, the, the data on Egypt. I mean, I, I worked on Eastern Europe in the time when those regimes collapsed. And we worked with them, we, the U.S. government, including intelligence, to help them move toward functioning democracies. But they were ready to do it. They had demographics that were dramatically different than what we see in the Middle East. They had a model right to their immediate west and so forth. And they wanted to do it. And they'd had experience before. You know, look at Egypt. Uh, it's the most important thing happening in the Middle East right now, I believe. And I'll come to Iran again in a second. But um, you know, what is unemployment in Egypt? No one really knows confidently. 25% would not be an unrealistic estimate. And that's just the men, because they don't include women in the estimate. And put un underemployment in that, it probably rises to 40%, 50% maybe. And then the whack they're taking on tourism, which is the major. So you see my point. Illiteracy quite high, particularly among females. Um, not a society poised to move quickly to prosperity and democracy, but wants to go in that direction. Beautiful thing. Um, that can affect the war on terror in that it can open up opportunities for extremists in sort of wave two, if there is a wave two, as I suspect there will be. But coming back to Iran, Iran, I think, is the real loser. The two big losers in what's going on in the Middle East, in a way, are Iran and, uh, regrettably, Israel, I think. Because Iran now is shown to be a country that you know, couldn't tolerate this kind of revolution. And yet they're seeing it happen in the Sunni world. And in a place like Syria, where there's great resentment among those who ultimately will probably control Syria, great resentment over Iran's support for uh, Hezbollah and so forth, um, that alliance is going to be kind of shaky. So I think Iran is going to face some, that all these things are sort of coming together now in ways that uh, create quite a, uh, an interesting brew. I'd, I'd just like to add one thing to your question, Vail, on NCTC, counterterrorism and counterproliferation, two very different models of very large consolidated uh, center for terrorism and this very small proliferation center and uh, which has only 70 people, uh, employees, how does it leverage the community e efficiently to ensure that proliferation gets the adequate resources, the collection and the analysis? It's very hard. Uh, Ambassador Detrani, who runs it, is doing a great job, but he's going to need a lot of help from from the uh, DNI. This is where the DNI can gain greater efficiency. And it's going to take a lot of support from the Congress and from the White House to make, uh, to make our counterproliferation strategies work effectively. We may have time for one quick one. Uh, and I and see answer. somebody raise, and a quick answer, yes. Hi, I'm um, Eric All with uh, iJet. As, uh, as we harden our, 
our uh, targets in the United States, it makes soft targets more and more uh, attractive to uh, Al Qaeda and, and other terrorists. And <clears throat> I'm curious where the tipping point is um, and the implications for intelligence gathering and making um, that intelligence actionable for state and local law enforcement to, to interdict that, those attacks. Well, when it comes to soft targets, uh, we obviously have many. We obviously have put our efforts on looking at mass transit, looking at pipelines, looking at the electrical grid to try to, working with the private sector, working with states, working with ports, uh, working with mass transit authorities to find those uh, areas where we believe it's most sensitive and most catastrophic. It gets back to the whole issue of risk management, which I think John alluded earlier. We have to make those judgments as to how to allocate uh, federal money. I think as, as Clark Ken Irvin in his recent paper said, you know, DHS has put out about $31 billion in grant money. Trying to find a balance on how to use it and use it effectively has always been a challenge. We're far better than we were, but we need to be much better. And we're going to have to take risk. We cannot continuously <laughs> spend money against every conceivable uh, threat and every conceivable scenario. It gets back to smart, very smart risk management, and that's where I want Homeland Security and the government to proceed. Well, it's well, another of the caveats you have to put on any um, optimistic projections about the future of al-Qaeda, because Zawahiri will probably favor soft targets. Bin Laden did not. That's right. Well, uh, I want to thank uh, both of you, Charlie and John. Uh, you've been both uh, insightful and unflappable. <laughs>